Good evening and welcome uh, to this evening's lecture. My name is Stephen Whiteman. I'm a senior lecturer in Asian art at the University of Sydney and the convener of the Sydney Asian Art Series. And thank you all for coming this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we gather this evening, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. As we come together to share research and learn from one another, I'd also like to acknowledge the millennia old uh, forms of systems of knowledge that are embedded in custodianship of land. This evening we come together for the third of this year's uh, Sydney Asian Art Series. The Sydney Asian Art Series, just to give you, those of you who have not heard uh, this little spiel before, a little background, is a cooperative effort, uh, initiative, uh, between three organizations dedicated to Asian studies, the study of art history, and Asian art. Viz Asia, most affiliated with the Art Guide of New South Wales, the Chinese Studies Center at the University of Sydney, and the Power Institute, also at the University University of Sydney. Uh, and it is presented with help from institutional supporters, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and also Sydney Ideas. And before we get too far in, I want to start by um, having a brief Oscars moment and thanking the many, many people, or some of the many people, who make uh, these events happen. Um, first of all, the directors of our three supporting organizations, Warwick Johnson, Mark Ledbury, and Louis Dutomba, who uh, thank you all for coming this evening, or all happen to be here this evening. Um, uh, also, uh, many of the people who work for these, Yan Yao of, of, uh, of Viz Asia, Josephine Tuma at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Melanie Eastburn and Natalie Seitz, two of the curators of the Art Gallery who have facilitated in particular Professor Timon Screech's visit, um, Yan Ping Zhang of the Chinese Studies Center, and most especially, if I may, Katie Euclea uh, of The Power, who has uh, made all the arrangements and coordinated Professor Screech's visit. So thank you all and many more, I'm sure. Um, this evening, as I mentioned, is, is the third in this series, uh, in this year's series of the Sydney Asian Art Series. Um, we have a three-year program, and in this second year, uh, we are looking at a theme that we've titled Uncertain Objects, Trajectories of Asian Art. And the idea of this, of, of this year's theme is to think of Asian art outside of, of our traditional associations with art as particularly bounded by nation or region, but rather to think of art, its creation, the artists who make it, and also its lives and afterlives as one defined in substantial part by mobility, by cross-cultural or transcultural interaction, by uncertain identities, by a lack of clarity, that many of the things that we think that we know about art, that it comes from Japan, that it's painted by a particular artist. In fact, we often don't know, and that some of the most interesting stories about our history lie rather than in sort of filling out the forms that go on the walls of our museums, and I love, I love tombstone information as much as anybody, but rather than feeling like we have to have an answer for every one of those forms, rather some of the most interesting things that we can say about art uh, come in these points of uncertainty, in these points of overlap, in these lack of clarity. Last semester, many of you may have joined us for two of the lectures, uh, the first two lectures of this year's program. The first was Winnie Wong, who spoke about, um, about uh, export painting, uh, the creation of export painting in early 19th century Canton, and particularly the studio of Lam Kwa, who is an artist who we don't really know very much about at all. We don't know precisely what he looks like. We certainly don't know what paintings he precisely painted. But what we know, particularly from Winnie Wong's talk, was that there was a proliferation at one one particular moment of uh, images after a composition by Ang that had been moving around the world uh, from France through print, through painting, and many other forms. And this was the topic of Winnie Wong's uh, talk. And then uh, subsequently, we welcomed Ajay Sinha from, uh, from Mount Holyoke College, who spoke about a photographic encounter between a, a famous Indian dancer, Ram Gopal, and a somewhat less famous but still fairly prominent New York photographer, Carl Van Vechten, in the 1930s thinking about the way in which celebrity identity was formed through the camera in a, in a cross-cultural fashion in the early part of the 20th century. 
Before I move on to tonight's speaker, I therefore want to briefly spruik the last lecture that will be coming up uh, in this series this year, um, which is by Nancy, Professor Nancy Um of the University of Binghamton. Uh, she is going to be delivering a lecture entitled Boxes Fit for Kings uh, on the 17th of October in the quad. So not here as we are, but I try to tell you which room in the quad is, but I, even I don't know which room it is in the quad. Uh, but keep your eye out for mail or in for advertisements. Um, the, the subject is particularly a particular type of glass production from Japan in the 17th and 18th centuries that circulated as diplomatic gift throughout the Indian Ocean during that period. And so the notion of objects, again, having a sort of cross-cultural or broadly more global currency that extended past their specific identity as an object made in Japan. Okay, so that's enough about what we've done and about what we're going to do. And now I'd like to briefly introduce tonight's speaker. Um, tonight, Professor Timon Screech is here, a specialist in Edo, Japan, and for decades, uh, a scholar at the forefront of thinking about J Japan and Japanese art in its global context. He received his PhD from Harvard in 1991, and since that time has been teaching at SOAS at the University of London. He's been a visiting professor just recently. He sent me a CV that stopped only two years ago and still had more places than I can imagine. Has been a visiting professor and researcher in recent years at Berkeley, Waseda, University of Tokyo, Yale, and I have to presume many others. He is also a fellow of the British Academy, a member of Academia Europea, and here this gets a little unexpected, a freeman of the city of London and liveryman of the Guild of Mercer Scholars. And one more, I'm gonna quiz him about at dinner and you can email me next week and I'll tell you what these various, um, these various affiliations mean. Uh, uh, Professor Screech is also the author of numerous books, including Sex in the Floating World, Japanese Erotic Imagery, 1700 to 1820, The Shogun's Painted Culture, Fear and Creativity in Japanese States, 1720 to 1829, several books about foreigners in Japan, including Secret Memoirs of the Shoguns and Japan Extolled and Decried. Oh. And most recently, Obtaining Images, Art Production and Display in Edo, Japan, which has sought to rethink cultural production, uh, both material and visual, in, in that period. He's also uh, written many more, including a number of exhibition catalogs in Japanese, and there are also numerous translations of the above. All of this together attesting to Tim's deep engagement with an international academic world, and particularly that of Japan. My own connection with Tim's work began with one of his first books, The Lens Within the Heart, The Western Scientific Gaze and Popular Imagery in Edo, Japan, in which he explored the mechanisms and stakes of Japanese experimentation with and selective incorporation of European pictorial methods by Edo artists. His emphasis on Japanese agency and rejection of overly facile models of influence and hybridity have not only been very influential for me and many others as we seek to understand more global circulations of art and ideas. They're also reflective of Tim's extraordinarily subtle thinking about the local and the foreign, the endogenous and exogenous, and how those are interwoven in early modern art. So tonight, Tim will be picking up a, uh, a not related, not so close theme, but another theme having to do with global circulations in, in Japanese culture, and he will be sharing work from his forthcoming book uh, from Oxford University Press, The Shogun's Silver Telescope, God, Art, and Money in the English Quest for Japan, 1600 to, 16, uh, to 1625. So if you all please join me in welcoming Professor Timon Screech. Thank you very much. Thank you. So first of all, I turn on my mic here. I'm quite loud, so I don't think you need the mic to hear me, but it's being recorded for posterity, so. All right. Thank you very much for the um, kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming. In, in England, if the sun shines during the day, nobody turns up for a lecture in the evening. But if that was the case here, <laughs> you'd never have any lecture attendance. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's been fantastic to have the opportunity to come and visit Australia. Only the second time in my life, and I've had a really, really wonderful time so far, uh, and uh, a couple more days to come. But today, anyway, I wanted to talk about um, one little moment, uh, which is the English arrival in Japan. And those of you who have spent time in Japan, working on Japan, reading about Japan, know, of course, that the 
Portuguese and Spanish were the first Europeans to arrive in the middle of the 16th century. The Dutch turned up at the beginning of the 17th century. The Spanish and the Portuguese were expelled. The Dutch remained, and they stayed there right through until the modern period. The Spanish and the Portuguese, of course, were involved uh, in trade, but also um, evangelism. The Dutch had no particular interest in evangelism, but they were interested in trade. And that's the way the story is normally told. It's not completely incorrect, but of course it misses out several things. And one thing it misses out is the fact that the English arrived at one moment. And the fact that you know, I happen to be English maybe is why I might be interested in it. But actually, the English arrival brought some other little factors into play, which can be omitted if you're telling a big overarching story, but which actually complicate and, and make the, the, the story more interesting. So I just wanted to share those with you today at the time available. Since there's no clock, I'm going to bring my phone out. If I look at my phone, it's not because I'm checking messages. I just don't want to speak for too long. I do want to speak for too long, but I don't want you to have to listen to me for too long. <laughs> so it really began with a trip I made to the countryside to this um, rather nice uh, regional mansion that's there photograph at the bottom and when I went there was a fair going on so people had parked all over the lawn which isn't really very nice it's called Prideau Place in the southwest of England in Cornwall uh, many family names end in O you may be aware of the famous professor Harold Belitho from Monash University who a great figure in Edo studies sadly recently deceased and professor Belitho spelled his name with an O on the end that means he came from a rather humble background if you think yourself posh you spell it E-A-U-X it's pronounced exactly the same so Prideau Place obviously old landowners of Cornwall. This building is from round about 1600, of course, changed a lot over the time. And I just went to see it purely as a tourist, and inside I saw this box. And it's intriguing. It's a very typical sort of round about 1600 maritime shape. So clearly this is something which has been made. It's not of English manufacture, made somewhere overseas in a certain shape for a certain purpose. And I began to think where was it made, why was it made, who owned it, what was it used for, became, before it came to rest for two or three hundred years in this um, Cornish stately home. Well, first of all, the shape. It's absolutely typical maritime shape, right? And if you, um, I'm sure many of you, like me as a child, you had your pirate stories, Long John Silver, 15 men on a dead man's chest, ho-ho for a bottle of rum. Chest, maritime chests have domed roofs. It clearly this is for use on a ship. And then, you know, pirates sitting astride boxes with domed roofs, it's, it's totally standard um, Long John Silver stuff. But then why should a trunk for use at sea have a domed roof? Lid. The Portuguese were the ones who came up with this answer. It's obviously not a case for moving goods around. It's beautifully made. It's for some elite person, the commander type person on a voyage, to move his, almost certainly a man, his things around, and they will be valuable things. So above all, it's like when you fly first class. You want your bag to go in last and come off first on the carousel. And it's exactly the same. If you go around your top, nothing can be placed on top of your trunk. Your trunk is the last one to arrive, the first one to come off, and it'll be above the waterline. So it's exactly a way of saying I travel first class, and um, it's perfect. So we know that Portuguese have discovered it, invented it already, but it's not a Portuguese case, because it's, it's um, decorated in a way that the Portuguese uh, did not decorate things. In fact, you look at it, you immediately say this mother of pearl inlay in a kind of um, half moon shape is Gujarati. It's from North West India. And these things are quite common in uh, collections around the world, round about 1600 elite pieces. The Mughal Empire is exporting things, itself exporting things to Iran, to Turkey, but having its goods exported by third parties, European ships or Arab ships to other places too. This one happens to be in the royal collection. You can see basically it's the same. It doesn't have the rounded top, but it does have an upper top, which probably simply means you can get more stuff into it. But also something could not be stacked on top. So someone's been discovering that if you make a, a non-flat top, you can't put things on top of it. Your thing is the top. So we've basically got a Portuguese shape with Gujarati designs. Now, that's perhaps not so strange. The Portuguese were all over India. But 
They kindly let me move the case away from the wall when I saw it stat against the wall and look the back of it. The back of it is like this. It's Japanese lacquer. So somebody who was thinking about the front did it in a way that's very special. And when they're at the back, nobody sees the back anyway, they went into default mode. And this is something that, um, well, it was sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's Arthur Conan Doyle kind of stuff that, that, that um, Dr. Watson, right, and Sherlock Holmes, how do you detect a criminal? When criminals are thinking, they, they throw you off. And when criminals go into default mode, they don't think what they're doing, they go into autopilot, that's when they betray themselves. The notion of the clue, right? And so this is the clue that the maker who was thinking the top, the front, it's all on commission, I've got it properly, nobody told me what to do with the back, what do I do? So they just make the back in the way they always made backs. It's clearly made in Japan by a Japanese lacquerer who'd been told we want this shape, who'd been told we want this kind of inlay, but he didn't, wasn't told what to do with the back. He also wasn't told to do with the inside. Nobody told him. So he just made the inside like any Japanese case will be made inside. It's a wonderful object that crosses many, many cultures in its conceptualization, its production, its shape, its technology, and then also, finally, its ultimate ownership, because it was not made to be an English house, it ended up there. When I asked the, um, the owners, Mr. Prido did not come out, but the guardian there, um, they said it washed up with the Spanish Armada, <laughs> 1588. Of course, it's a completely impossible story. This is not quite as old as 1588, but it wouldn't wash up anyway. I think probably this would sink, right? So, so, but that's another layer of mythological interpretation for justification of the ownership of objects. In other words, we didn't buy it. Right? We're a rich family. We don't buy things. We get given them or we assume them via some kind of larger ownership. In this case, we destroyed the Spanish and we got it that way. Right? So the stories are uh, manifold, overlaying, true, untrue, and intriguing. So when I uh, literally looked into this um, casket a little bit more, uh, it turns out that there's actually several of them. There's at least half a dozen of them known in European collections today, maybe some in uh, unknown collections. This one's in the Victoria and Albert Museum today. They know that it came from this house called Aston Hall. House has been torn down today, but very typical grand English house of about 1600. And Again, if you look inside it, you have um, uh, a Japanese interior on an exterior, which is Gujarati, and then in a Portuguese shape. So this all began me thinking about movement of objects, about the agency behind them, behind their production, about um, why you want certain things which are not the things you'd grown up with. These would have been very novel and exciting at the time. And that turned me to looking at the creation of the East India Companies. Again, the Spanish and the Portuguese arrived in Japan with essentially missionary groups. The Dutch arrived with the famous Dutch East India Company. Uh, but the English East India Company was there too. And it was founded by this fellow here, Sir Thomas Smith. At the time of its foundation, he was just Mr. Thomas Smith. And uh, he realized the Dutch had been involved in many very lucrative trading ventures overseas. He wanted to do the same thing for British ships, but it's expensive to send ships away. Many of them will uh, never come back. Investors might lose their money. You can also get Asian things. You don't have to go all the way to Asia. You can get Asian things in Amsterdam or in Venice or in Istanbul. So the East India companies are monopoly organizations. Right. The point is that you may not land Asian goods except on a company ship. And so Thomas Smith was able to persuade Elizabeth I to agree to these conditions, and the East India Company came into existence on the last day of 1600, 31st of, of December 1600. Nice easy day to remember. This picture obviously was made a little bit later. And Thomas Smith's and East India Company's objectives were to buy the things that came from the East Indies. They didn't yet know exactly where those places were or what they might produce, but they knew the things that they'd all be ready buying by third parties, most principally spices. The English had gone as the 
as the Dutch and the Swedes and the Danes, they've been buying their Asian things, first of all in Venice, the merchant of Venice in Shakespeare. But if you cut out the Venetians, you go right to buy them in Istanbul, much cheaper than buying them in Venice, but they haven't come from Istanbul. So then you've got to avoid the Mediterranean, and go all the way around, and that's what these companies do, sail directly to Southeast Asia to buy spices. And those of you who like cooking will know that even today, it's astonishing how expensive spices are. You know, a little pot of pepper costs you, you know, whatever, however many dollars it is. And even a two or three nutmegs cost you $10 today, right? So um, spices were extraordinarily expensive things at the time. They made insipid North European food more palatable. But also many spices were given medicinal properties, especially nutmeg. Nutmeg was believed to be a cure for a plague. Plague was still rife. So Thomas Smith, even the head of the East India Company, would himself die of plague in the year 1625. Plague, after all, is a horrible leveler, right? If you're very wealthy and you eat good food, you don't get ill that often. But plague hits everyone. And so it is a, a cure for plague will cost as much as the richest person in the country is prepared to spend which is a lot. So it's worth sending ships all the way from Amsterdam or London uh, to uh, Southeast Asia to buy principally nutmeg, but also clove and pepper. And that is indeed what they wanted to do. Now, being Australians or living in Australia, you know this map. But if I'm talking this to Europeans who have a very cloudy view of Southeast Asia, then, of course, you um, go around. Is this the right? Okay. You go, of course, you go around uh, Africa, just down here. Uh, you, can, you can go to India, Gujarat, that's where that casket comes from. But you just go straight across. Now, getting from Europe to Java and Sumatra is actually very easy. I mean, your ship might go down, but there's no difficult sailing involved. But going f and so that you can then buy your spices here. And the Portuguese were controlling down through... Um, the Straits here, right, Malacca, and the Dutch and English cannot use this route. They have to go through um, the Straits here, the Sunda Straits, and the spices are produced around here. Getting through is not so easy, only two little sea lanes, but you can buy them here. So the English are basically going to buy spices on Java. They hope one day to get through Java, to cut out the art Javanese and buy them direct at the so-called spiceries. That would happen in due course. For the first 10 years of the East India Company's existence, that's what they do. They send ships from London to Java, buy spices, turn around and come back home again. Well, this is um, our, our map, of course. They didn't have a map like that. They had a map a bit more like this. It's slightly later, but it shows pretty much the 17th century conceptualization. Uh, it's very obviously dangerous sailing around here. There's an awful lot of islands. It's not clear where there are reefs and shoals. It's quite different from sailing across the Indian Ocean, which anyone with a good wind and uh, knowledge of the stars can do. Here you're going to need local pilots with local knowledge. There could be pirates um, hiding around anywhere. It's very deadly. So don't do it. Right? That's why the East India Company is perfectly happy just to do its trading here. But they run into a problem. The English are buying spices. They know what they want to buy. But they're not going to steal them, or well, they probably would like to, but they can't. So they have to buy them with something. And what are you going to pay for them with? Well, they pay for them with silver, because England's at war with Spain. Spain controls the silver mines of Latin America. Francis Drake and all those people, they steal the so-called plate ships, the ships being plata, silver, from, from the, and that's absolutely fine. But after the death of Queen Elizabeth I, King James I comes along and he makes peace with Spain, suddenly the English can't steal Spanish silver anymore. So they're going to have to pay for the spices with something else. Well, that's fine. England had one, well, one excellent export product, and all they need to do is bring that over. It was woolen cloth. English woolen cloth was of very high regard at the time. One half of all sheep in Europe are still in England. 
All right, we eat a lot of Australian, New Zealand sheep today, but still, uh, wool is a very big product. So what you've got to do is bring your wool over, and the Javanese have never seen sheep before, and they probably will love to buy it, make the exchange that way. And that's what they do, ship wool comes over, and the Javanese say, we love your um, wool, but you do realize it's 40 degrees outside most of the time. <laughs> so um, the English then think, well, we've got to find somewhere else to sell our wool. And ideally, that somewhere else will be a country that produces something that the Javanese might like, such as, for example, silver. Well, there are many foreign communities around here, and there would have been Japanese people around at the time, 1600 or so. And Japanese people would immediately say, our country has long, cold winters. We have no sheep. There are no sheep in Japan. And we produce silver. It's the absolute perfect solution for the English. They will go to Japan, which has no sheep, they will sell their woolen cloth to the Japanese for Japanese silver. Don't forget, half of the silver ever found in the world was found in Japan. The other half was found around uh, Peru. Yeah. So uh, Japanese have an abundance of silver, no wool, and it's a perfect, wonderful exchange. And that's what the, they think that they will do. And so the East India Company, after a decade of existence, decides to branch out to Japan. Now, this map uh, is probably more or less what they'd have had, and they would look at it and say two things. First of all, here is Japan. No Western ship had ever circumnavigated Japan, therefore no Western uh, geographer had ever mapped it. It's fine, the Japanese make perfectly good maps of their own, so you just put a Japanese map onto a Western map to fill in the blank. And because nobody had sailed around it, nobody knew the size of Japan. Take a look at it, it's about 25 times too big. It's bigger than India. So that gives a completely deluded idea of the size of the Japanese market for wool. <laughs> uh, the other thing that they, um, that they are mistakenly led to believe by this map is that coming around here and getting through all these islands, of course, many of them belong to the Spanish, and it's going to be very hard for the English to get through without being attacked. This is going to be a nightmare. Well, what about going over the top of Russia? Simply go this way. And the map suggests that, you know, why can't you? I mean, it's not that far north of England. It shouldn't be too hard. And Siberia is entirely absent. So it's going to be about six or eight weeks sailing, drop right down, and you've got Japan. This is their intention. And I have a nice quote from the um, professor of geography in Oxford, 1605, who wrote, before I die, I am convinced I can write a letter here in Oxford in May and have it delivered in Cathay before the end of the summer. So this is what they want to do. As long as the route over Russia is still under debate, they will go this way. But before very long, they hope, quick sailings back and forth, no busy messing around with all the islands of Southeast Asia, Japanese silver, uh, spices down here, back, and the whole thing will be very quickly done. And so to that end, as part of the negotiations to expand the East India Company's work, they open trade with Russia. Now, I'm not an expert on Russian history. I don't want to um, speak in front of possibly there are some Russian experts in the room. But Russia had its own problems at the time. In fact, this is a period that in Russian history is known as the Troubles. There were various uh, usurpers and uh, con contested um, uh, uh, inheritances amongst the Tsars. Boris Godunov is on the throne at the time, subject of a wonderful opera, during which in the opera the, the Dutch ambassadors arrive. Unfortunately, if Mazorks had got it more interestingly, he would have had the English ambassadors arriving, because what the English ambassadors got up to, I'll tell you in a second. But the Russian problems li linked partly to the fact that most Russian trade had gone through the Baltic, and by a strange quirk of inheritance, the king of Poland, who's of course Roman Catholic, inherits the crown of Sweden. Therefore, both sides of the Baltic are suddenly under Roman Catholic control, who hate the Germans and who hate the Russians, who won't let any ships through. Russian trade is totally stymied. And so what the Russians do is open up a new port, Archangel, for the English and the Germans and the Dutch to go over Scandinavia and come down here. So already the ships are sailing to that northern part of Russia, which they've not been doing in previous centuries. And so the English sent an ambassador to Boris Godunov with three requests. 
the ambassador chosen is none other than Thomas Smith, who's turned into Sir Thomas so that he can function as a proper ambassador. Three requests. First of all, may we try sailing this way to get to Japan? Second request, if we're not going to be sailing around Africa and India anymore, can we take African Indian goods through Russia without paying any tax on them? Request number three, will you ban the Dutch from trying to do the same thing? <laughs> and to get Boris Godunov's good wishes, they take a, a, tru a truly stupendous present. They take an amazing carriage. This is the oldest existing horse-drawn carriage in the world, taken by Sir Thomas Smith as a present from James I to Boris Godunov in 1605. Boris Godunov decided to uh, celebrate the arrival of this uh, embassy. He was very uh, interested in it. There's actually a very long history of English-Russian relations. Uh, and uh, he, had, he celebrated in the Boris Godunov style a seven-hour lunch, at the end of which he collapsed, and the records say, with blood flowing from all his orifices. <laughs> So Thomas Smith at this point was already halfway back to, to, uh, to Archangel with the permission to trade and to ban the Dutch from doing the same thing. Rush, runners dash after him, catch up with him and say, uh, the Tsar is dead, but don't worry because his son who will take over now will continue to endorse the treaty that's just been signed. So with great relief, Sir Thomas Smith continues to the coast and back to, um, to, to London. Meanwhile, Boris Godunov's body cannot be found. You'd think it could be. It was large. Somebody had sequestered off somewhere. And so it's the Dutch who spread a rumor, and they probably believed it. Boris Godunov did not die. He was a usurper. He knew that he's going to be attacked. He was escaping back to England with Sir Thomas Smith, taking with him the entire Russian treasury. If that had happened, the history of England would be quite different. However, Boris Godunov was dead, his son did take over, and the English go back with their permission to make these explorations over the top of Russia. The carriage sits this day in the basement of the Kremlin. Well, it's 1611, finally, with experimentation going over Russia, but of course, not yet having got to Japan, they never would because they discovered the seas were frozen, but they're still hoping to go there. In the meanwhile, they will experiment with trade through this rather dangerous way of going through Southeast Asia, the Philippines, and on to Japan. And this is the kind of ship we're talking about. Uh, of course, no such ship survives. If you've been to Perth, I was in Perth last week before coming here, and there's a lovely replica of the first Dutch ship to get to Australia, called the Dove. Tiny thing. This is a little bit bigger than that, but still about uh, 60 or 70 men would have uh, completely filled it, and it goes off laden with English um, wool to try and persuade the Japanese to embark on trade for the first time. The ship, interestingly, is called the Clove. It tells you what they want to do. Right? The naming of ships is a whole different story, because, because the Spanish and the Portuguese always call their ships after saints, Madre de Dios, or something, right? So the Dutch and the English always very much in your face use Protestant names or commercial names. But in any case, it's called the, the Clove, uh, and, and, and off it sails. James I um, officially sent it. The East India Company pays for everything, but they want a royal prerogative. So when they get to the pan, they probably will meet the Japanese king. They don't know who this person is, but of course there'll be a king there somewhere. So in all likelihood, the ship went with a very appropriate present for the king of Japan. And under European thinking of the time, that means a royal portrait. So this particular portrait of James I is all over the place. James I is famous for having hated to be, uh, to, he hated having his portrait painted. So there's only one or two portraits that get endlessly recycled. And this is made by John de Critz, his official court painter. <coughs> and um, it's, it's, there's, there's dozens of copies around the place. So very likely it was sent. We can't unfortunately prove that it was on the ship going to Japan. But... We can sort of suggest it might be, because a couple of voyages later, which I won't talk about today, but a couple of voyages later that go to the Mughal Emperor, 
does take this portrait. And we know that because the Mughal emperor had it copied into a Mughal miniature. And, and the title is, The Great Mughal Prefers the Teaching of a Sufi to That of Foreign Kings. <laughs> Uh, fascinating portrait is own right because the actual Mughal emperor is very interested in Western painting. You see the hourglass, the putti. It does have a lot of Western bits and bobs in it, but fundamentally, of course, it's a, it's a Mughal painting. So anyway, it's possible that this first ship, sailing 1611, takes a royal portrait. We can't tell. But we can tell, when the ship eventually arrived, what it would have as the royal gift from James I to the king of Japan today, of course, we'd call him the Shogun, and it was a telescope. It's the first telescope that ever left Europe. It's the first telescope that was made to be a royal presentation object. Now, this, of course, is simply a conjectural reconstruction. Galileo had done his experimentation with the telescope only in 1609, so for a, in late in 1609, actually. So for an early 1611, for a telescope to go in Japan, that's absolutely perfectly extraordinary. And Galileo's telescope was simply a tube with lenses. I mean, it wasn't supposed to be beautiful or anything. The one going to Japan is referred to as silver, silver gilt, actually. Silver gilt means that you make it from silver because silver is a very hard metal, but silver is not that rare, so you then gild it so it looks like gold, but you can't make it out of gold because gold's too soft. So silver gilt is a very common uh, royal gift level kind of material to have, not like a piece of wood. Why a telescope should have been selected is what my book is about. So for lack of time today, you'll have to wait. Uh, all I will say, very simply put, just in two sentences, is that the Spanish and the Portuguese are already in Japan. And most principally, they are represented there by the Jesuits. And the Jesuits, as well as trading, of course, are converting the Japanese. And one thing the Jesuits are very, very big on is education. Probably some people in this room had a Jesuit education. The Jesuits teach the Japan, all Japanese, all kinds of things. And one of the things they teach the Japanese very, very serious-mindedly is astronomy. The Japanese and the Chinese are obsessed with knowing about astronomy. One thing is particularly the prediction of eclipses is really important in East Asian thought. So the Jesuits and the Portuguese are teaching the Japanese astronomy. Of course, they're teaching them that the Earth revolves around the Sun. Heliocentricity is a big talking point. The telescope proves heliocentricity, right? Anyone with a telescope can tell all those things the Jesuits have been telling you about the Earth is the center of the world because Jesus Christ was... Uh, it's a lie, right? So I think that's the point of the telescope. But at any rate, one came. Now, no early telescope survived. This is the earliest known depiction of a telescope, known to me. Somebody may know an early one. A telescope survives here in a painting by Bruegel, sight from the 5th century. 1618 is a little bit later, but it is a silver telescope. So, um, probably the one that went to Japan looked something like this. At any rate, the shogun, technically speaking, he's the retired shogun, Tokugawa Ieyasu, a retired but still maintained the trappings and the powers uh, of office. And he was living in retirement, not in Edo, modern-day Tokyo, but in this place called Shizuoka. It's a lovely, if you haven't been to Japan, or if you have been to Japan or are going again, don't forget to make a stop in Shizuoka. The castle in which the retired shogun lived has been re partially rebuilt. It burnt down historic times. So he was living here when the English ambassador turned up and handed over the telescope. However, he's technically speaking the retired shogun. His son is the acting shogun living in Edo, Tokyo. So he says, please go and Asked my son for permission to trade because he and well, so uh, the English troop off to Edo. It's only a couple of days further on, and they give another present there, which happens to be a large, beautiful goblet encased in jewels. Uh, and the shogun gives a reciprocal gift, which you must give, which was a wonderful suit of armour. 
It made its way back to London, and from that day to this, it has sat in the Tower of London without having been moved. Recently, it's been removed to be restored. The Shogun himself, being now notionally in retirement, does not give military goods. He gave, as a reciprocal present, five pairs of gold screens. <coughs> They don't survive, we don't exactly know, but this is the sort of thing we're talking about. Um, there's a wonderful pair of gold screens in the, um, in the uh, Gallery of New South Wales. I saw them yesterday, the kind of this huge, wonderful things. Five pairs, this is one pair. Uh, they were given, uh, they were taken back, and um, they would, in due course, as I'll tell you, arrive uh, in London. The, um, when they arrived in London, so the, so the ship, in any case, the, 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 the transfer of goods happens, the Shogun receives his telescope, and he gives the English permission to trade. Uh, the English ambassador representative goes back to London with the armor, with the screens, and the ship arrives back in 1614. Left in 1611, arrives in Japan in, in, Japan in 1613. From 1613 to summer 1614, it sails back to England. Now, having got from Java to London in um, nine months, extremely fast, it then spends three months sitting in Plymouth with the head of the East Company expedition saying, the winds are against me, I can't get the ship out. Now, this is rather suspect. Right? The company wants that ship round in London so that they can unload it. And he's saying, I'm keep trying, keep trying, keep getting blown back. Meanwhile, he's selling everything off. <laughs> right. So the head of this mission, whose name was John Cyrus, became suspiciously wealthy as a result of the, the voyage. The company gets very concerned about this and say, well, um, we're going to send, we're going to have a pilot come around. And eventually the ship comes around. And when it comes around to London, off come the permission to trade, the screens for the king, the armor also for the king, these wonderful gifts. But John Saris, the head of the, head of the mission, had thought to himself quite sensibly that if the king is receiving a number of Japanese screens, surely Japanese screens are going to become very desirable commodities for wealthy people in London. The king's got one, everyone else is going to want one too. So he bought half a dozen or so other pairs of screens, which he also brought back on the clove. It's quite possible he was secretly trying to sell these in Plymouth without it being noised about. But in the end, he didn't sell them. They did come back. They arrived in London. And so Thomas Smith has a look at the screens from the Shogun to be given to the king and the screens that Cyrus has bought to sell on the market in London. And he comes to this amazing conclusion. The screens which are sent under his majesty are not so good as some of those which the company have. Not above two or three should be presented to his majesty using some of the best the company have instead of them. So amazing, the shogun must have given the screens some of the best that possibly could exist. And John Cyrus has bought a few in the market in town. And Thomas Smith, so he moves them around. The king gets his allocation, but they're not the original intended ones. Now, it's just an amazing thing in the history of taste what it could have been that led him to this conclusion. We can't tell because we don't have the objects. Maybe there was more or less gold. Maybe it was subject matter. Some subject matter were thought more royal than others. These ones are bird and flower screens. Maybe, maybe that you know Europeans don't really want pictures of pretty flowers and birds. They want pictures of a more robust kind of subject. Who knows? But the screens, some screens did go to the king. And we have no records of them except that when Oliver Cromwell came along and liquidated the royal collection, the collection was sold off. We have the records of the sale. So the Japanese screens were sold off at that time. Uh, in other words, they'd been in the collection. They were spread around various royal palaces. So they clearly had been valued by the king. And the other screens which the company had bought, whichever uh, they got, they get then sold off. And again, we know who bought them. We know how much they paid for them, and we know the subject matter as recorded by the English sale catalogue. Things like scenes of hunting, pictures of fowl, F-O-W-L, bird and flowers, some referred to as somewhat resembling warfare, 
Pictures of hunting. So these, anyway, warfare hunting, these are things that English buyers at the time should have liked. Uh, and they, was, they spent many pounds on them. The screens were sold for five or six pounds each, which was a lot of money. And the left hand, right hand sides were sold separately. So if somebody had bought both pairs, they'd have been spending about 10 pounds. For 10 pounds, you could get a very good Italian masterpiece at the time. Right. So the screens were certainly valued, sold off. We know who bought them, but unfortunately, in these East India Company sales, only the investors in the voyage are allowed to bid at the auctions. And then, of course, they'll resell at the profit. So we don't know where the screens ended up, although we do know their initial purchases. Um, Cyrus had also thought to come back with large quantities of lacquer. Now, Japanese lacquer, as we saw with the trunk I started out with, is something that had been valued in Europe for a very long time. Screens had infrequently been imported. They're difficult to ship around the world. They like to get damaged by seawater. They take up a lot of space in a ship. But lacquer is more robust. And so already the Pope, the King of Spain, they already have collections of Japanese lacquer. And it's natural to think that the English are going to start to want some too. So Cyrus comes back. And as well as the screen sale that takes place, a lacquer sale takes place in London. In fact, the lacquer sale takes place first, 4th of December, 1614, with only, only days of the ship arriving back in London. They sell off the lacquer. And that must have been because they knew they'd get great prices for it. The uh, investors are very anxious to have their investment uh, returned to them. The other things the Cloves brought back, the paintings, of course, it's bulk cargo, which was spices. That's going to take longer to sell. You don't sell the whole cargo in one minute because you'll flood the market and you won't get good prices. So that will take months to distribute piecemeal. But these things will go immediately. And then, so it's actually the very first art auction in all of British history is a sale of Japanese lacquer. And again, it went for large amounts of money, uh, depending on how much inlay and gold it had. The more inlay, the more expensive. So sometimes it's called a large case. It doesn't go for much money. And then it's said uh, an inlaid case, and that goes for much more money. So this we can't prove that this is part of the sale, but it's again been in the English country house for several centuries. It's a, it's a so-called so drop front case. Again, it's a European um, shape, but made by Japanese craftsmen. This kind of classical doorway here, which has the lock and then a little, little drawer in the middle, totally out of Western um, uh, 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 design motifs, of course. It's filled with drawers, little important things, your seal, uh, maybe some jewels, uh, some important crucial letters would be in this, and then you raise the top and you lock it closed, nobody can steal, but also in a ship with lots of movement, the drawers aren't going to fall open. So again, it's an elite maritime object. Such things, at any rate, arrived in England in quite large numbers, 1614. Um, Cyrus had come, therefore, with presents for the king, somewhat similar things to sell on the open market, also with lacquer, that's not a royal gift, this is bought for sale, uh, and also a whole range of other little Japanese objects, small lacquer things, not as grand as this, but little cups, of course, he commissioned some beer tankards uh, made in lacquer, uh, which uh, came back too. Uh, also, little sort of, you know, bits and fans. And these are also put up for the comp by the company for sale. And they don't go for auction. They can go directly onto the London market. And they go for sale in a building which, strangely enough, has been rather forgotten to history. A building called the New Exchange. If you're familiar with London or you get the chance to go there uh, soon, go to the Strand. Probably you'd go to the Strand anyway. And there is uh, Charing Cross Station. And right in front of some Charing Cross Station is a little sliver of a thin strip called, uh, and today it's, um, uh, I think, Pizza Hut has it. But it used to be this rather grand building called the New Exchange. And the New Exchange was built by Inigo Jones, the first English architect ever to have studied in Italy. 
uh, precisely to sell newly arriving exotic things. The East India Company has an outlet in here. So you would go and you would buy your Japanese stuff, Chinese stuff. Right? When the new exchange was opened, there was a gala opening, and the text from the mask, right, the play of the opening, has recently been discovered, having been lost. And the text is narrated by somebody called the Chinaman, which means a person who sells Chinese things, not a Chinese person. And the so-called Chinaman refers to cases I have which, which weigh less than a feather, and yet you could hardly touch the bottom. That has to mean Japanese lacquer chests uh, for sale at such a place. It doesn't, of course, exist today. The building has long since been knocked down. But by being placed on the Strand, uh, the Strand is not in the city of London, nor is it in Westminster. That means it's not in the mercantile city, nor is it around the court and the royal palace. Strand obviously means along the river. It just was a strip of land along the river. So to build this place here means that merchants can go and courtiers can go and they can mix. Men can go and ladies can go. So very soon the new exchange becomes associated with rather loose and louche kind of behavior. Saucy goings on, as they refer to it. Right. And um, interestingly, this happened, would happen recurrently over the course of history, where Asian things arrive, they are non-categorizable, they challenge categories, and what slips in through categorizational breaks is always saucy behavior, right? The policing and the disciplining of codes falls apart when you introduce these foreign things. Right. So the Orient and the erotic and the exotic going together, and this was a spot where it all happened. So, so many um, Jacobean period plays, Shakespeare has stopped writing at this point, Ben Jonson, so, so many of their plays re re relate to uh, going, inappropriate goings on at the New Exchange. People went to buy things that were uncategorizable objects. And they go to buy them at a space, which is a strange building. Nobody had seen such a thing before. Well, um, it's just coming up to seven, but let me say a little bit more before I stop. I've told you about the first ship that went and what it brought back and what might have then happened as a result of the ship coming back. But before the clove, the first ship had even come back, the East India Company is so delighted with the prospect of selling wool to Japan in exchange for silver, which they will then exchange for spices. They sent a second ship to Japan. They should have waited to hear news about what the place was actually like. They couldn't wait. So another ship goes off, and what it goes, of course, with loads and loads of wool. And somebody had told them that these foreign people they like art. Right. So they also filled the ship with 120 oil paintings. It's absolutely amazing story, as far as I know, unprecedented. 120 oil paintings, about half of them were portraits of ladies. And, um, and, and we have the names, the Countess of Somerset, right. Princess Mary. And I'd love to know, were the countesses saying, oh, please send my portrait to the Emperor of Japan? Or did the ladies think it's a bit of a cheek that somebody was sending their portrait? We just simply have no idea. But they're referred to as portraits of ladies. And uh, they're commissioned by some London atelier, and we don't know who. But what we do know is that going with this next ship, which is called, by the way, the New Year's Gift, a very Protestant name, right? Protestants don't approve of Christmas. And to show that you disapprove of Christmas, you celebrate New Year, which falls right in the middle of the 12 days of Christmas. And when I was growing up, uh, we didn't celebrate New Year, right? Because at that point, England was not so Protestant. But in Scotland, no Christmas, right? That's why Scots are so big on New Year in those days. Anyway, uh, the New Year's gift um, sails with about 60 portraits of countesses and duchesses and such people. We don't know who painted them, but going with them is a little memorandum about care of the ships en route. 
and it says be careful of them because they are new. Therefore, they were specially commissioned to send. They weren't just old stuff bought. Anyways, it, it, it explains about how to look after the pictures en route, but it's signed Roland Bucket. Now, Roland Bucket may not be a household name today, but he was one of the most famous painters in London about 1615. And in fact, several works of his do survive in 17th century collections. It means that, assuming he wrote the letter about preservation of the objects, it must mean his atelier produced the objects. So the East India Company had gone to the best atelier in London to get these pictures to send. Who had told them that the Japanese would like pictures of ladies, who knows. But that's half of the consignment. The other half of the consignment are referred to as bawdy pictures, which probably means classical nudes. They couldn't find anyone in London who could paint decent nudes. So what they do is they say, oh, the Italians will be good at that. <laughs> But the English refuse to buy paintings from Rome because they're all papists and they won't buy things from Rome. So they say they must be from Venice. Of course, Venice is also a Roman Catholic country, but at the time, Venice had very adversarial attitudes towards the papacy. And believe it or not, the English are fully of the belief that the Church of Venice is about to reform itself as an independent church based on the Church of England. This was entirely believed at the time, right? So they say, well, buy the Venice. They haven't got time to send people to Venice to buy them. So they nip across and buy them in Rouen, the main port of France accessible from England. And so off they go and they buy a whole pile of Venetian paintings of nudes in uh, Rouen, bring them back, put them on the ship, and off they go. Right? Now, we have no idea what those paintings were like, except that they were Venetian. And if you're talking about Venetian nudes, of course they weren't um, modern-day women lying naked. They were Mars and Venus and Paris and such things. It always means Titian, right? Tiziano, who is the great founder of the classical nude, already 50 or 60 years ago before this time. And Titian's nudes are everywhere. And they were repeatedly... Um, copied, uh, forged, pastiched, made into prints. Prints are black and white. A, a, a good painter can knock up a coloured version to you. So it's almost certain. And indeed, when the ship arrived in Japan, five paintings were entitled Venus and Adonis. And in all likelihood, they were literally this. Except this is the real Titian. And the ones going to Japan were some copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. When they um, arrive in Japan, the ship uh, arrived there in 1616, the second ship, the first ship arrived in 1613, second ship arrived in 1616, and this um, gobsmacked merchant says, we've received a large cargo of England, many pictures show ladies. The others show, show pictures, the, 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 the betokening of which I cannot fully understand. Right. Well, a merchant has no idea. I mean, he doesn't know classical literature. They don't have titles pinned to them. He just thinks uh, a, a woman trying to get a man into bed with her. Um, so the English are a little bit surprised about them. Now, regrettably, we have no documentation whatsoever about what the Japanese thought about these things. The English East India Company in Japan, of course, has a warehouse and it's periodically re-inventorized. The things which are sold don't figure in the subsequent inventories because they've been sold. And we can see from the inventories the paintings are dispersed. They go. So Japanese buyers are buying them. And what they did with them afterwards um, we simply can't tell. But uh, if I'm always looking for, for some Japanese person will say, oh, you know, in our storehouse back in the countryside, we've got some pictures like this. And they may one day turn up. But the problem with the Western pictures going, Japanese pictures going to the West, is that people just stuck them on the wall. Japanese screens aren't made for being hung on the wall for 100 years. They fall apart. And equally, the Western paintings have varnish, which has to be removed and re-varnished periodically. If you don't re-varnish them, they just turn black after a certain period. And so the picture probably became uh, invisible and was thrown away. So this extraordinary exchange, which simply took place between 1611, the first ship goes, 
1616, when the second cargo arrives, it's only five years. An amazing exchange took place, which could have changed the history of art in both Northern Europe and Japan. Nothing happened as a result. Both sets of pictures just simply disappear from the record. But it doesn't mean to say that people at the time weren't extremely excited and enthused by what happened, but they haven't left a legacy. Now, the final thing to say is that, of course, they're going to Japan because they think you can do that trip over the top of Russia. And when they discover, first of all, the ship can never get to Japan over the top of Russia, nor for that matter can they go over the top of Canada. The Japanese also say, it is indeed true we have no sheep, and we've never had such a thing as wool clothing before. But did you think we were just shivering every winter until you turned up with your wool? <laughs> Japanese have perfectly good woolen garments, and in fact the first winter the English are there, they throw away all their woolen cloth, which is so scratchy on your skin, and they buy this lovely Japanese winter clothing. And the Japanese say, you're not even wearing it yourselves. How do you think we will buy it from you? Well, it so happens that there is a Siamese, a Thai um, mission through Japan at the same time, and they say, we'll buy it. It'll make perfect elephant blankets. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure, yes. Yes. And we welcome some questions. No? Yes, no? The lady at the... Oh, yes. Oh, good. Hi. Nice to see you. Oh, wait. We have a mic. Hold on. If you hold on one second. I'm looking cold, actually. Cold? Ready? You need some wool. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. Fantastic. Absolutely amazing. So did all of this transpire from the chest? <laughs> Narratives are always false, aren't they? Um, but uh, so I've been interested in the East India Company history. Uh, well, basically what happened is that they sail in 1611, they arrive in 1613. So five years ago, 2013 was going to become the 400th anniversary. And there was a move afoot to do something to, to celebrate the 400th anniversary. So I got involved with this thinking about that. And finding that trunk was, was completely fortuitous because I simply honestly went there as a, as a tourist. But that was a sort of a peg on which I hung it, yes. It's exciting research. Thank you. But it also survives. The other thing is that the problem I have with this story is that nothing survives. The things which went in both directions are gone, except for the one suit of armor which is still there. So at least that trunk is a surviving object. The mic's on the way. Uh, thank you so much, um, Professor. Um, here's my question. Like, in a particular period, China and Japan were restricting or even closing their borders for shrinking commercial activities with foreigners. And as I know, some Chinese historians claim that this re restriction was re closely related with a huge amount of silver flowing into the country, both countries, which resulted as issue of the domestic economics. Do you agree this concept, or what are the other re reasons which may it happen. Yeah, thank you. So the uh, good question. So the so-called closing of Japan happens after this time. At this point, you know, anyone can sail in and, uh, and, and trade wherever they want. Why Japan closed, and indeed if Japan really did close, because they never totally closed, is a huge debate in Japanese historiography. Some say that it is related to the control of Christianity. Some say, as you suggest, that it's the outflow of, outflow of silver had become so great that they're concerned about that. Uh, some also say that they, you know, in the 1600s, Japan is still more or less in a state of civil war. And when the shogunate begins to fully control the country, which it doesn't, doesn't do until the 1610s, then they start to want to um, control trade because so much money comes from foreign trade that they want to bring it under their own shogunal control, which necessarily means restricting it. So these are the various things. That, in the case of China, I'm not 
competent to talk about China, but the Chinese have tra trade is not yet happening with the Chinese mainland at this point. Chinese goods are coming through Southeast Asia, so they, they buy silk in Java, and, and some, some porcelain and things also bought in Java. Another interesting story, sorry, but this is just triggered nothing in my mind, is when the first ship comes back to London, the clothes bringing the suit of armor and the, and the... So they ask the person that's come back, what should we send to Japan? We just sent a whole lot of paintings. What should we send next time? And he says, Japanese ceramics is really awful. Send British ceramics. <laughs> and, and in fact, it's not such a bad idea because in 16... Japanese porcelain industry begins in 1614, right? They, there wasn't any when the first ship turns up. By the time the second ship arrives, the Japanese are making porcelain. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little footnote. Uh, but anyway, what you, you raised a really important question. It's, it's, it's a very, very broad one, and many people have different views on the subject. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I loved the, the talk. At, at the end, I was so sad that, like, there was no trace of, of any... Uh, is there really no? Like, I don't know, even, like, the way, for example, I don't know, like... European objects are represented in things like Nambambiobu that could have possibly been, I don't know, just, one, is there really like no well, trace or? One thing I was deliberately being a bit cheeky today because recently in the series that you're doing now, the movement of objects and transmigration of objects is a really hot thing in, in our history at present. And it's a fascinating story. But of course it's predicated on the things that survived, like that trunk I happened to see. Uh, there are six that survived today in Europe. If all six had happened to be destroyed by fires, that story could not be told. So, um, the, 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 you know, um, as our historians, we tend to deal with things which survive, but the things which don't survive are so much more numerous than things that do survive. And if an entire category of objects has disappeared completely, then does that mean we don't study it? Right? So I actually rather like, perversely, the fact that I'm telling a whole story about things which do not exist. Right. And, just, and as an art historian, I think it's a slight corrective to the idea that we should only study things which are still there. <laughs> but, but as you imply, there was kind of trickle down across many, many things. Yes, yes. Hello, thank you, Professor, so much for this. Um, I'm, um, the, the, all the information is so fascinating in the topic, of course. Um, I'm just intrigued by the story bit uh, and how it plays into your research. So if you can elab elaborate a little bit, because obviously it was um, very difficult to track down all the objects. Yes. And uh, so how do you, being an art, hist like art history researcher, and I'm a PhD student, as well as being an artist, so being a storyteller, and I see that that's yeah. coming through so much. So how do you, how do you bring it all together? I mean, in a way, that's what we have to do as researchers, right? It's, it's, it's wonderful reading archives and gathering notes and exactly. fun side, which is what you're doing now if you're working on a PhD, right? But at some point, somebody will say, now you've got to write stuff into a thesis. Yeah. So you then have to construct, I mean, after all, we don't, some people write catalogs and do databases, and that's fantastic, right? But in the humanities, we have to put it together into a story. Yes. And, and if your story... Um, tells everything, then it's not a coherent story. And if your story leaves out certain crucial things, then it's a fake story. So steering it through, leaving out things which are unnecessary to be known, but taking a different trajectory, of course, is, you know, it comes with practice, I think. Okay. Uh, and, uh, of course, different scholars, you know, do it in different ways. Yes. But I think I was quite lucky here that, that a voyage is itself a story. Yes. So I had a narrative that's there, and, and, and the East India company was very strict on demanding that its, its servants, as they called them, are kept journals. Mm. So the archive of the East India Company is, is very extensive today, mm -hmm. um, and, and just, it's wonderful reading. And, and, and the, per the person who ran the East India Company in Japan, uh, you know, he was actually a very highly trained person and, uh, um, and had absolutely nothing to do. He was just trying to sell wool for years and nobody would buy it. So he just wrote all these amazing things that he was thinking and what he'd seen and wonderful descriptions of Kyoto and things like that. Thank you so much. John? Thank you, Tommy, for that wonderful talk. Um, <clears throat> could we go back to the silver? Because that's very interesting. It's the first time I really understood, and you made it very, very clear, 
the English pursuit of silver, of course, that's linked to the opium, yeah. tea and opium later on. By the middle of the 19th century, the Mexican silver dollar is the currency of, the, of, of trade in East Asia. Was there any linkage in this cycle to the Manila Galleon, mm. which brought the silver from uh, Mexico to the Philippines, and the Philippines was a, a province of, of mm. the Regency yeah. in, in, in Mexico at the time. I don't understand. And then the Chinese, of course, dominated that trade to Manila and brought silk to Manila, which then went back yeah. for the silver. What, what's the trilateral relationship between this search for silver or trading goods which would allow them to get silver? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's really a question for an economic historian. Um, but but effectively, you have two places in the world that produce silver. One is Spanish-controlled Mex Mexico and Peru. And the other is Japan, which, of course, initially, no European country has a strong foothold there. The Portuguese are the first ones that get to Japan. And therefore, the Spanish and the Portuguese both have their silver um, source, with which they will do various things, such as produce their own currencies and make alloys. But really, the point of silver is that almost anywhere in the world understands the value of silver, because it's been moving around for so long. So that you can take a, a silver ingot it doesn't matter if it's Moscow or Isfahan or, or Jakarta, and people will buy things with your silver, which they won't do with other objects because they can't evaluate the, the, the worth of it. So, so the, main two the main two trading blocks, Spanish and Portuguese, have their silver sources, and that's great for them. But then when the English and the Dutch come in, they have to find some other way. Right? So the English initially... Um, take it on the high seas from the Spanish while they're at war with them, and then can't do that any longer. So they're no longer at war with them. So they can, of course, legitimately buy the Spanish silver and then trade with it, but that makes the whole trading uh, non-viable. So that's another reason why the trade eventually with Japan collapses. Japan's not half as big as it looked on the maps. You can't go to the top of Russia. Even if you could, Siberia is in the way. It's, much, much, it's almost as far as going around Africa. And finally, there just is no goods that they can take to Japan, which is worth buying things. And finally, actually, to be honest with you, Japan didn't produce anything that anyone wanted. They went to Japan because Marco Polo had said it's the land of gold, and it's like, you know, go there and try. But, you know, you can buy porcelain cheaper in, in, um, in, 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 in Java. And Japanese lacquer is a very, very high quality. But the problem with Japanese lacquer is it's very expensive to buy in Japan, so the markup is very small when you get it home. So, um, and, that's it. and then, in my humble opinion, that's why Japan never gets colonized. Partly because the Japanese are very rough and they have swords and you couldn't probably colonize them anyway. But also, Japan simply doesn't have anything that anyone wants. Lucky for them, really, honestly. You know. So, 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 so the, one, the point is that once the silver's gone, the silver's completed. And then Japan has still copper, but the copper's depleted. And, and so, the, of course, Japan does have some things we want, but only, really, they have silver and copper, and it's all gone. And then it's very, very high-quality things, which are also expensive to buy in Japan, and therefore they don't, they don't, don't make sense as commodities. We have a few more minutes. For some more time. I have a question. So go ahead. Yes. In. I want to go back a little bit to um, to both the the, the, the coffin with the star. Yeah. But, but you don't have to go back to it. Does you? But, but actually, that well, thing just went by. Oh. The, the, the the writing desk, the yeah. portable desk. Yeah. And can you describe both of them as as of a certain date? Was my sense maybe exemplary of the types of things that were on these very first voyages? Yeah. So what I'm curious about is that. These are very. These are obvious on very early voyages, but they reflect, in this case, a particular European shape, yeah. as you say. And then the other case, not only a European shape, um, and but also a a Indian mm. uh, decorative pattern. So I'm wondering a little bit about, especially given the relatively early date of this in in this whole process, how it is that these these um, shapes, particularly mm. I suppose mm. the Indian shape, makes a sort of third tangential move, mm, mm. Not, maybe it makes it via Europe, but mm. how does it get from yeah. northern India over to Japan yeah. where it's starting to be produced in workshops there for a European market? So my assumption would be that the key place is Goa, 
that the Portuguese take Goa in India very early on. And although this is Gujarati, it's further north. But of course, the Mughals are train, tra trading. And the um, Mughal emperor, we, we saw that one portrait of the Mughal preferring the teaching of a Sufi to that of foreign kings. But the, the Mughal emperors over various generations were extremely open-minded. And they even invited Jesuits to their court. And, because they wanted to know what the Jesuits thought about this and that. Jesuits couldn't believe it. They kept on thinking that the Mughal emperor was going to convert because why else would he want a picture of Mary? They're totally unaware that the Muslims also venerate the Virgin Mary. So. Um, but anyway, there's a lot going that way. And I think that the Portuguese take it from Goa and then some wealthy Portuguese person says, you know, I want one of these cases with a round top so that my stuff's always on top. But it's much more tr fashionable to have one made in Asia. And the Japanese lacquer, where Japan comes in, so why not get a good Gujarati one? The point about Japan is that lacquer is so light. You get it made in, made, made in India, a wooden case, it will be heavy. Made in Portugal, oak, it'll be even heavier. The Japanese cases are highly desirable for these mobile things because they're so light. Then they say, but I'd like you to make it with Gujarati. Yes, yes. Know, here's a sample of this. Yeah, word. yeah. So does that mean that Gujarati decorative patterns yeah. are circulating with a certain cachet to them at yeah. this time, as distinct from yes, Japanese? Yes, yes. Um, again, I'm guessing, but I just think the iridescent quality of that mother of pearl was something that Europeans immediately understood. I think also that a case... Um, that's being moved around on ship occasionally. It's going to get wet, it's going to get exposed to the sun, and that lacquer will actually degrade. So lacquer is absolutely beautiful if you keep it in your house and look after it, but it doesn't survive rough treatment. Whereas a mother of pearl inlaid thing is more robust. And if you notice that each of the inlays is inlaid with a little rounded nail, so it actually protects the mother of pearl. Um, so that's my assumption, that there are, there are, you know, there's no records of any such things. Uh, there's one little interesting case, I can't, I can't resist not telling you this, but the Mughal emperor, actually not the Mughal emperor, the governor of Bengal, so the other side of India, uh, decides he wants to get some Japanese lacquer, and he doesn't know what um, shape to have it in. But he, so he says, I'd like to have a, a sedan chair so I can be carried around Bengal in a Japanese lacquer thing because it's so light, right? And so the, the Dutch, not the English, the Dutch will commission it for him in Japan. They take a model. And they, um, the Dutch say to the, the lacquerers in um, Kyoto, uh, it's going to a Mughal potentate, they're Muslims. Please do not cover it with naked ladies. And the Kyoto lacquerers were not going to cover it with naked ladies anyway, because they never do. But it's this Freudian slip. They keep thinking, no, no, no. So they covered it with naked ladies. And... and <laughs> And the Dutch thought, oh my God, you know, but they, it, they're so expensive, they took it there anyway, and of course the, 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 the Gujarati um, governor absolutely loved it. And <laughs> went down to... Are there any other questions? No? Well then, please thank, uh, join me in thanking Professor